Well, good day to you and uh, welcome to this introduction to the nature of public theology from our book, uh, African Public Theology. And uh, I'm Dion Foster from the University of Stellenbosch and it's a joy to introduce you to that chapter. Now, the chapter begins by asking an important question and the question is, isn't all theology public? Now think about this for a moment. Are there really such things as private beliefs? For example, if you have certain beliefs about money, the ways in which you spend your money in public will be changed. Uh, we see, for example, negatively how views on gender, for example, some religious persons hold negative views of uh, the roles of women in church and in society. And of course, those views don't end in our homes. It stops wives, daughters, sisters, mothers, women from being able to participate fully in society. So whatever our beliefs are, they affect our social lives, our political lives, and our economic lives. So in that sense, the answer to the question, is there such a thing as private theology, often considered the opposite of a public theology, is there such a thing as a private theology? Of course, the answer is no. All beliefs have a public consequence and uh, reach into our public lives. They reach beyond the doors of our churches and beyond our homes. And so for that reason, for persons of faith, particularly for Christians, because we do live a public faith, we have to think very carefully and critically about the ways in which we, we live our faith, both within what we consider to be our private lives, but also in relation to our public lives. So if all theology in that sense is public, then why do we need a discipline called public theology? Well, the first reason is, as I've already mentioned, because of the role of religion in public life. Um, certainly in many countries across Africa, in South Africa where I live, um, you can see that religion plays a role. We, we have church buildings when we drive down our streets. Um, we have people who have programs on television and on radio, um, people who wear crosses around their necks. There are even uh, persons who evangelize. We have politicians and business leaders who hold religious convictions and views. And so will choose to do something or refuse to do others. Um, currently, there's a case in South Africa of a Christian doctor who uh, refuses to uh, perform uh, medical abortions and does that by virtue of his Christian views. So these kinds of things, the ways in which our faith intersects with public life, either in, in terms of, of structures like churches or denominations or religious groupings, or for us as individuals or as our for smaller family units, um, that has an impact upon our societies and upon the democracies in which we live. But of course, the, the opposite is also true. Not only do we as religious persons, persons with convictions and beliefs, uh, change the ways in which we operate in society, as society changes, it also impacts upon our lives. For example, I know that some of the persons watching here may live in societies where there is a plurality of religions. So there may be, for example, sisters and brothers who are Muslim or Hindu. And the presence of other faiths in our midst surely has an impact on how we practice our faith. South Africa, for example, we have a multi-religious constitution and the protection of religious freedoms, which means that no one religion may dominate uh, in public life or in social life. No one religion may uh, have supremacy or protect special protection under the law. All of us are to operate under the, the general protections of our democratic state. So, of course, those kinds of things often change the ways in which we live. Um, I've certainly worked in countries across the world where, where Christianity is a minority religion and where persons aren't allowed to register uh, religious buildings like churches or places to meet. So we can see that in both those senses, there is a need for us to think very, very critically about the intersection of what we believe, our theologies, and the societies in which we hold those views. So how our views, our beliefs impact upon society, but also how society uh, impacts upon our lives. Now, the next section of the, of the chapter, we look at the notion of public in public theology. So we have an idea what theology means. That's the study of our beliefs and our convictions, our ethics that arise out of that. But what does the public mean in public theology? Well, in the discipline of public theology, and it has become a sort of academic discipline, 
we tend to think of the notion of the public as that space in which people's ideas can encounter one another. Now think about this. Have you ever heard the phrase public opinion? So for example, um, now in, in the time when uh, we're dealing with the coronavirus pandemic, we often hear news agencies or politicians or health workers speaking about public opinions, about how the virus is being treated, about lockdown rules and regulations. What does the public think? Now, the public isn't a specific group in any way other than that they have a set of ideas, a set of, of convictions, beliefs, ethics, practices that bind them together. So Jürgen Habermas, a very important uh, philosopher, was one of the first persons to help us to, to understand how ideas bind us into a kind of public. And very often, a set of ideas which are shared by people go beyond just thoughts and they take on physical form. I mean, think, for example, about uh, what we saw happening in the United States during the, the Trump administration, the building of the border wall. Before that physical structure was built, before the wall was built, there was first of all a set of persons who shared a certain set of ideals about what it means to be American, about what it means to protect America. And uh, somehow in their minds, they came to believe that perhaps God cared more for Americans than God did for Mexicans. And so they, they said it's okay, even for Christians to build a wall and, and keep others out. Now we can see very often how a set of opinions, a set of ideas can bind people together and it can turn from just a set of ideas perhaps into policies in a nation. Uh, we see in certain nations in Africa, for example, how they view issues of, of sexuality and marriage or, for example, issues related to healthcare and, and reproductive rights, as we've talked about earlier, such as, as medical abortions and, and other such things. Very often they find their way into society through a sort of public opinion, a public agreement uh, into policies and laws, and sometimes even into physical structures like buildings or armies or, or, or uh, you know, groupings, political parties, for example. Now, that's the sense in which we use the public in public theology. David Tracy, who was a very important American Catholic theologian, um, helped us to think about at least three ways in which theology operates in three different publics. And he spoke about the way in which theology operates in the public of the academy. So where I work at the university, you know, our primary aim is not evangelism. Our primary aim is science. We want to know what is true and what is right and what is good. And we want to back it up with evidence. We want to do research and look at, at numbers and ideas and to, to be able to defend those reasonably. Then we have the public of the church. The church is, is very different. I myself am a member of a church. I'm an ordained minister. And when I preach on a Sunday, I don't deliver an academic paper. There I'm wanting to be emotive, persuasive. I, I can quote the scriptures and pray with my people. I, I can encourage them and, and lead them towards what I, I think are, are good and wise and th good things to do that, that honor God and, and work towards God's kingdom. And then Tracy says we have the third public. So the academy is one, the public of the church is another, and then the uh, public of society at large. And of course, we do very often see beliefs and convictions expressed in, in non-church or non-theological ways in public life. For example, if the state says that, um, you know, medical abortions are permissible, that could create a, a conflict of theologies. Or think about a place like France, for example, where they say that you may not evangelize uh, in public. That, that is a theological claim. Or, or a state that, for example, forbids religion, like the former, uh, you know, Soviet uh, uh, Republic, some of them that said, you know, religion was a bad thing. That's a, a theological conviction. So, David Tracy says that we operate in each of those three different publics using different styles, different methods, different language, and we often have different theological intentions. So that's the sense in which we use the public in public theology. Now, when it comes to, to public theology, you'll see that in the chapter, I speak of public theologies. I use the plural. Now, why do I do that? Because at the end of the day, the one thing that we realize is that public theology is not one thing. It's not like biblical studies or systematic theology or church history. It's not a discipline as such as some people think. It's not practical theology. 
because the reason is if we were too tired to one specific discipline, it wouldn't be public anymore. Could you see that it would be prescribed, it would be privatized within a particular set of language and methods and a particular community? So public theologies operate in various spheres of society across various disciplines, and it can be approached in, in many, many different ways. However, as you will see in the chapter, um, there is some consensus developing in the academic discipline of public theology that there might be some characteristics. And these characteristics that I highlight are just one approach uh, that say that public theology goes across all disciplines. So we know of public theologians who work as biblical scholars. We know of public theologians who are ethicists or systematic theologians. I myself am, am a, a New Testament ethicist. I'm a public theologian. We know practical theologians, missiologists who are working in public, and you'll encounter some of them. We even know of economists or doctors who have Christian faith who are operating in public theology. So what might be some of those characteristics? Well, we highlight six there. First of all, we say that public theology must be theology. So it's not political science, it's not uh, psychology, it's not sociology, it's not economics, even though we may touch on those issues, our primary intention is to do the work of theology to try and understand beliefs, to try and, and deal with convictions, to, to deal with, with those deepest things that relate to our Christian sources. So of course the Bible features prominently. The traditions of our churches and history are very important in doing the work of theology. How have churches dealt with difference, for example? How have churches dealt with pandemics? How have churches dealt with, with political conflict in the past? What does the Bible tell us? What resources do we have? So that's the first thing, a biblical orientation. Secondly, we believe that public theology should in some senses be multilingual. You know, one of the mistakes I think theologians sometimes make is that we think we're experts in every field. And that simply is not true. It makes God small. It makes God's revelation small. And you'll see in this book on public theology, we often enter into conversation with scientists. We enter into conversation with political theorists. We enter into conversation with the arts and media, with literature. And in each of those fields, there are experts. Some of them, of course, are people of faith, but not necessarily. You know, some of the most important things that we know about medicine come not from persons who are necessarily Christian doctors, but just from people who are trying to keep people healthy and keep them alive, keep them safe. So, so very often the work of the public theologian is to, is to translate our convictions, our Christian concerns, our doctrines, our beliefs, our ethics into those worlds and to translate them back. I'll give you an example. Um, I serve on the World Economic uh, Forum's uh, expert network for, for religion. And um, very often when I consult in those forums, behind my, my engagement with colleagues from political science and sociology and anthropology and economics is my deep held Christian belief in, in the need for justice and equity and goodness and the integrity of creation. You know, what we might find, for example, example in Micah 6 verse 8, what does the Lord require of you but to act just, justly, to love mercifully and to walk humbly with your God. But I can't quote that scripture in the World Economic Forum. I have to think about how do I translate justice into economic policy? How do I speak it in the kind of language that an economist or a political scientist would understand? How do I speak about what it means to live carefully with humility in the world in relation to an environmental scientist? But of course, the opposite is also true. Very often I have to read economic reports or environmental reports and translate them for ministers, for, for theologians to, to be able to make them accessible for them. So that's the second thing. We often have to be multilingual. The third thing is that public theology is often multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary in nature because we're dealing with important issues, big issues like gender issues, for example, or economic issues. We often need to work beyond our disciplines. So we can't just read the Bible. We can't just deal with doctrines or philosophies of belief. We can't just look at church history. We can't just look at how we implement it in practical theology. We often have to work across all of those. Sometimes we even have to work outside of theology. 
as I've said. We have to work with economists or scientists or others. So, so transdisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity is one of the characteristics of public theology. Thirdly, uh, fourthly, sorry, we believe that public theology by you know, its, its uh, nature tends to be public. And so if we believe that, that we are trying to discover truth, what is good, what is right, what is wise, we should be able to provide some kind of political direction. Now, by political, we're using that term polis. How should society be structured so that humanity flourishes and creation flourishes and the will of the kingdom of God is, is achieved for justice and for mercy and for peace and for love. So, so very often we have to be able to, to provide that kind of direction, to speak to business leaders or persons who have political power to say, we, we want you to reconsider this policy or the way in which you're running your business so that it stops harming people or exploiting people or, or, or damaging the environment. That's, that's what we mean by providing political direction. What is that based upon? Well, this is the next characteristic, the fifth one. Um, public theology is often prophetic in nature. Now, by prophetic, we don't mean the kind of prophecy that we often see in, in contemporary evangelical or Pentecostal churches. What we're talking about is the kind of character of prophecy that we encounter in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew scriptures, where the prophet would listen for the will of God in relation to society and, and speak to people, would warn them to say, if you live in this particular way, it will displease God and it will harm people. It, it, will, be, it will not go well for you in creation. So that's what we mean by, by a prophetic nature. Often we are having to try and understand and work out what is the will of God in a particular situation, an economic or political or social situation, and, and how do we then translate that into ways in which society might be able to, to process it and receive it? Finally, we believe that um, the sixth characteristic is very often public theology is intercontextual in nature. Now, what do we mean by intercontextual? Yes, of course, it does mean that we are often working across different contexts, Chicago and Lagos, Cape Town and London. So those contexts certainly matter, but we also use intercontextuality in a very different way. By intercontextuality, we mean the universal and the particular. Those two contexts, the universal context and the very particular. I'll give you one example of that. A lot of my work recently has been around the politics of forgiveness in South Africa. How do we facilitate a true, meaningful, thick, transformative forgiveness amongst black and white South Africans after apartheid. Now, of course, the universal principle, the, the general context is that the Bible tells us we ought to forgive, that our Christian faith reminds us that we should be forgiving people. But what does that mean within the particular context in which I live? How should white South Africans deal with their privilege and, and deal with reparation and issues of land and economics and power? Can you see that we're commuting, we're moving between the universal, the call for forgiveness, and what should be done in a very particular context in order for that to be achieved. That's one form of public theology. So that's just a very brief overview and introduction to the chapter. I hope you found it uh, helpful and interesting. Um, a copy of the chapter will be made available in PDF format, and you're welcome to read that. And uh, we look forward to further discussions. And of course, you can contact me if you have any comments or questions. So thanks for watching this video. I hope you find the rest of the book, African Public Theology, useful.